the shit's popping, it's popping. Nick and Stu, aka Setmo. Here with Setmo. We are Setmo. Electronic duo creating vocal driven house music. What does a successful music career look like to you guys? Every day we get to just either make music or go and play music to people. It's such a vibe. On that note, what is the vibe? The million dollar question. How much of a track success comes down to hustle versus just like the chips falling where they may? All of our best songs were all written in like a few hours. You can have everything perfect and then it falls flat or you can drop the track that fucking pops that you never expected but you know what to do when it pops. So what do you do when it pops? You can get fucked over pretty quick uh, in this industry. Yeah, I got shivers. It seriously got shivers. Hi, I'm Adam Metwally, and welcome to That One Time, a podcast where we converse to pillars of health, wealth, and wisdom. Today's guests are Nick and Stu from Setmo, a Sydney-based electronic music duo who are known for their vocal-led house music. They've been a staple in the Australian music scene, headlining many of the major Australian music festivals and releasing multiple albums to commercial and critical success. This conversation explores the evolving dance music scene, creative processes, and how to craft a song from start to finish. I love this conversation because I've known Nick and Stu for a very long time and they are experts at their craft. I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you like it and haven't already, please give this podcast a subscribe and a five-star rating as we're on a journey to a thousand subscribers and it helps us more than you can imagine. Stu, Nick... Setmo, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, bro. Hey, bro, how you doing? Uh, thriving. Living in New York, just uh, in in the little podcast studio that we're building. It's uh, things are very exciting and very inspiring right now. I'm, I'm jealous. Very... I miss New York, bro. It's such a good city. When you guys make it back, hopefully by the time you make it back, I'll probably own about ten venues and. That's it. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, yeah. Studios. You can. Yeah, it's gonna be a one bedroom studio. <laughs> we have to sleep in a double bed and I'm paying Look, ten thousand dollars. We haven't done before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the only difference is you're paying ten thousand dollars a month for it. Yeah. Yeah. Worth a butt. Mm, exactly. Well, look, let's get into it. So um if you could give an elevator pitch of who you guys are, what you do and how you're contributing to the world, what does it sound like? We're two guys from Sydney who have been making and playing dance music together for over 10 years now. Yeah, we make um, vocal-driven house music that hopefully makes you feel things. Yeah, and dance and, yeah, feel good. That's how we're contributing. Yeah. Making people feel good. Yeah. Bringing vibes to the world. Dance for. We, lo- we love vibes. Vibes are what makes the world go around. So. Hell yeah. It's true. Uh, Positive ones. Positive, you know, and negative just a, ones. Just make a, I mean, too. all vibes <laughs> make the world. But we're, we're providing positive ones, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Anything above 130 BPM. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I got you on record for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, um, you know, maybe we can split this up individually, but like what are the contexts of your early years that allow us to understand you guys individually and then coming together? Yeah, because Stu and I, we didn't meet until we were both in our early 20s. Like people often, well, one, think we're brothers a lot of the time, uh, but two, just assume we were like at least childhood friends. But we both grew up in Sydney. Um, I, yeah, was I, I lived in Sydney. I lived in New Zealand for a few years as well as a kid. I got right into music, uh, started playing saxophone in primary school and got right into that. I was like playing in jazz bands and then big bands um in my teenage years that kind of led me into like a love of hip-hop i don't know what the connection is there but that was like kind of the first music i think i really got right into as like a kid and you know bought heaps of cd started going to concerts and stuff like the all ages ones at at that time and then at this time i turned 18 that's when i kind of like started going out and clubbing and just discovered dance music way more and i would just it was clear that I was right into it because, you know, people would go out on the Thursday, Friday, Sunday night, but I'd then be like driving to clubs in King's Cross on a Sunday night just to see a DJ. It wasn't as much. Obviously, I loved the partying and going out with friends, but it quite quickly became clear that it was more than, you know, just the party aspect. I was really into the music. And then that's what kind of led me down the DJ path, 
saved up, bought a pair of decks, started playing at home, started playing at some house parties, and then and then got my first couple of gigs in the cross, which is then what led me to meeting Stu. I had a similar similar kind of situation. I was a flautist, so played the flute in the uh, <laughs> in the school band, and yeah, is that and, and it was great. It was hey, yeah, that's it. That's the word. That's the word. Saxophonist and, and, and it, flautist. The timing was primo because uh, um, what was the movie called? American Pie had just come out, and uh, I don't know if you remember the flute joke. I do. I do remember the flute joke. Yeah, cop that heaps of school. It was mad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> That was that was my intro. I was, but I like, I never wanted to do music seriously. I kind of like picked up the flute because in primary school, you, I just remember we walked into a classroom and they had a bunch of instruments there, and it was like, blow blow on this thing or like do that. You know, like it, basically you walk around and it's like hit this drum. No, you suck. Yeah. It. Okay. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I got the lips, the natural embouchure, great for um. Great for the flute, juicy lip. And I had to, uh, mm. I had to walk to school as well. So big. I was, I was a little kid. Um, so heavy, big instruments were out of the question. So the flute was the natural op- option there. Grab that. No tuba. Kept running. <laughs> Definitely no tuba. Although, I, I, like that was the other thing that I like played French horn. Oh, it was like I nailed French horn, but it was too heavy for my small frame. Too big. But um, that yeah. But I never really kind of planned on getting into music. But um, I started working at Maya at Macquarie Centre and my lunch breaks were spent in HMV when they still had the CD things at the end of the aisles and you pop the headphones on and just pick the CD. And I like, I've always been like really attracted to the visual side. So like the pack shots, the cover art of things. And um, first album I ever bought was Prodigy, Fat of the Land. And then like shortly after that was... um. Mezzanine by Massive Attack, just because that cover art's so sick with the big beetle on it. And that kind of, that was like my introduction to dance music. I also have an older brother who's seven years older than me, and he was just always playing wicked stuff at home. Um, and it was very similar similar to Nick. I um, started partying, loved it, loved going out, was going out like three to five nights a week, um, and just went from there. I like, I started working at a bar in, Paddington called at that point called the Fringe Bar. Now it's called the Unicorn Hotel on Oxford Street. And uh I I actually lived with the manager there. And it's a kind of cliche story, but I was I was learning, I I was DJ at that point, but not professionally. And um one night I was the day manager at this pub, so I was like the cellarman. I'd do all the kegs and stuff like that. And the first DJ called in sick for dinner service. And I'd finished work, I had my stuff, jumped on, played a set. He was like, oh, you're actually okay at this. And then started getting booked. And that was for like a big hospitality group. From there, started getting booked to other venues. And then I was like, oh, sick. I can do this as a job. And that was it. And that was actually the venue where Nick and I kind of like broke down for the first time. It's true. Wednesday night party called Friends. Yep. <laughs> it's a good name for a party. Great party. Yeah. And then for a party. Do you think and that, that was kind of, that was, that was the beginning of Semo, really. Like we just, I think we'd both, we were both working pub jobs. Yep. And, uh, but like the DJing started to pick up, you know, back then we'd be getting, I can't remember what we got paid at the pub. It was like 20 something an hour. But all of a sudden you're getting paid like a hundred bucks an hour to go DJ. And we can I do that. I thought that was like, your DJ rate for a second. That was, What's that? Nah, nah, nah. nah. <laughs> it sounds great. Right. I mean, look, pro- probably for some of the gigs, but um, yeah. early on. When you even it out for the ones you didn't get paid for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then it was like quickly we were like, we don't have to work these pub jobs anymore. Yeah. And I didn't have any other mates that didn't work nine to five. We were both just like, I think I'd taken the punch just shortly before you and I was fucking lonely and bored. Can I swear? Is that fun? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I was just like, I remember trying to G you up being like, quit the job, quit the job. Like, come and hang out. It's mad. We don't do anything through the week. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It was right. It was because we were, yeah, like early 20s. It was right around the time when a bunch of, our mates were like finishing uni and going, getting their full first time job. And, you know, your first full time job at 22, 23, you're not, you're not getting a great salary. And we were like working four nights a week and earning more money than them. And as you said, it's like we had every weekday free, like during the day. And we're like, what should we do? So we just like hang out. And I was just at Nick's place constantly. Yeah. We just have a mix there. And yeah. 
I think that quite quickly then like led us down the, you know, we wanted to start playing parties together and we realized that the parties we wanted to play, like everyone who was playing them were kind of, they were more artists than just straight DJs. Mm-hmm. So we realized the next logical step was we needed to be making music and we we're pretty clear at the time about the music that we, like the mutual overlap of the music we loved and wanted to play. And then that kind of made it relatively straightforward with like the music we wanted to make initially. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think it was that contrived though. That no, point. no. It was, it was like, it was honestly like a product, product of boredom. <laughs> we hung out so much and there was only so many things we could do. And we were like DJing constantly and recording mixtapes. And we started putting out these monthly mixtapes and I was like, kind of fucking bored of this. Like, we want to make these tunes. We don't just want to play them. Like, true. let's make these things. And they, we did it so poorly to start with, as everyone does. But like, we're so excited that we could make something to then play in the sets. It was wild. Yeah. You know? Mind blowing. Yeah. 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 It was mad. So uh, fun days. <laughs> yeah. Do, would you think that going out a lot made you better at DJing and like? understanding the electronic music culture and produ- producing definitely for sure definitely for sure just exposure to it it's like just observe even if it's subconsciously we're observing what works on the floor what records are getting played what's the style how hard how like how quick do you mix you know there's so many different as nick said uh earlier there's a million ways to do this um but like we just soaked it all up we're like sponges at that age you know just like we were out constantly watching everyone. It was kind of mad because we we both had different DJs as, as idols. Mm. Um, like you were way more into Ajax and stuff, which is I would more... follow Ajax around <laughs> uh, Sydney and like watch him play like three sets in a week just to like That's so cool. see what he's playing, see the records that he was playing in every set, see the ones that he just play in certain contexts, and you know for trying to find those tunes as well before they were released and. Like that was such an exciting feeling, just being like, "What's this tune?" and then trying to get your hands on it before it was out. And it was kind of, you know, obviously back in the day when it was vinyl and stuff, people would have records that no one else had. But then this was still kind of right before, like a lot of streaming, like Spotify was a real thing, and and it, you definitely still people would have tunes that, you know, Shazam was even really a thing then. You yeah. have to like know or find out what those tunes were. It's all Bloghouse. Yeah. It was yeah. Like- yeah. Yeah, and that, like for anyone that's not across that, it was just like, it's been, I mean, Nick had a blog. Um, <laughs> yeah, what was the blog called? Staying sick. Sick. <laughs> Is it still live? I think it's still up. There, yeah, yeah, go suss it out. Go. Like it was this huge thing. That was where you found music, and these blogs of race to share these bootlegs or edits or unreleased tunes, whatever it was. Um, and the, it it was just like it was a crazy time because it was this race. You know, not everything was available always to everyone. Yeah. It was like a, the closest digital equivalent. I mean, it's kind of happening again now, but it was the closest digital equivalent of the records. DJ holding up the record. I've got this track and you don't have it. So if you want to hear it, you have to come to my set. Yeah. It's, 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 it was do. really fun. It was really exciting. Uh, they just hold up the tune towel. Tune? Oh, and really? then like they get taken <laughs> down. The tunes would get yeah. taken down. The blogs would get like, the posts would get shut down because yeah. it was like a Licky Lee vocal or like some major label yeah. you know track that had been remixed and the, they were like no get this get this offline you're sharing this for free what are you doing it was mad yeah i remember in my very small soiree of and what am i saying soirees around uh in my very small time period of like producing music for with any consistency there was um an edit of breathe me by sia that i put out i'm talking this is like 10 years ago and salacious sounds the Oh, yeah. Okay. Picked it up. Yeah. And then it went viral <laughs> and it got like 250,000 listens on SoundCloud. Pump it up. And hit number two, it hit number two on Hype Machine and then Ooh. it got taken down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, the first and last time I, I like released anything. <laughs> Dude, you could have like fully launched a touring career off that. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> followed up on it. That was it. So, yeah, now the track's up again and it's been up for a long time, but it's just like, wasn't like it didn't doesn't get picked up now and it doesn't really matter and i haven't written music in a very long time but that was a fun little moment Damn, for sure I'm suss that out yeah, yeah it's scary. super chill it's like a really nice like chilled track but um there uh, there's something i was wondering about you know 
the fact that you guys went out for a lot. Like I went out a lot. I worked in nightlife, you know, hosted, promoted, and I was in the in the environment a ton. There's an, another generation of people coming through now that really don't leave home. And then they have this like huge blow up using social media and they don't have that feel for the room anymore. And I'm wondering, has that art been lost of DJing? And is it actually like a lost skill that even matters? Like, I don't know. I, th- I think like, you know, the f- for our generation, the default was to become a DJ first, produce a second. It was kind of rare that you would come across people that made music and didn't DJ, you know, in an electronic sense. Um, and now it's the opposite, you know, like DJing is a is a necessity for them to be able to play the shows because there's demand because they popped off on TikTok or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, they've made the they've made the viral tune. Um, so, like, I think I think maybe it's and look, DJing DJing takes time to get good at. There's no. There's no shortcut. Man. There's no shortcut. You can learn to beat match. You can learn the skill in a day, but reading the room, having the tunes, having the recall to think of that tune when you're like midway through a set at 2 a.m. in the club to think of that tune from eight years ago, not necessarily eight years ago, but you know, like to think of that right tune, that takes time. It takes sure. time and experience. So like I try not to, like I try not to shit on the new guys because we sucked when we started. Yeah. You know, like we we thought we were killing it, and we probably weren't. <laughs> um, so it's I don't know. I think it's well, I think it, people can get thrown in the deep end a yeah. lot, a lot easier and quicker these yeah. days because it, it, exactly what you said. It's like yeah, you can have one thing blow up, and then you're quite quickly getting booked for pretty big gigs. Mm. If you haven't spent that time playing in front of crowds, doesn't matter how much you practice. You know, in your bedroom, in the studio, whatever it is, DJing. It, as you said, it takes that time of just like. We still to this day we like get new tunes, we test them out, and like we know, we know the environments we can test tunes where versus the ones where we'll just do the things we know work. You know, like if we're playing on a big festival stage, we're not playing a brand new tune for the first time, or we're not playing many. You know, you you, you do things that you know work, and we're lucky because we tour and we have been touring for such a long time that we play in those different contexts where you get the opportunities to, to try stuff and and figure out what's working. And things change also, like quickly. Like a club environment, a feel in a club now is very different to when we started. Yeah, and it should be. You know, like we're we're in a different world. Things are changing. Technology is changing. The way people consume music is changing. So, um, it's a constant learning kind of learning curve. You you never you never make it. You never get to that point where you're like, okay, got it. I'm sick. Like we, we could jump in and do a decent job, but like if we want to do a really good job, we've got to keep working at it constantly and like stay in touch with everything. Like yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a full-time thing for sure. How has it changed from what you previously, uh, used to experience? You guys have been doing this for what, 10 years now. So yeah. How has that energy in a room shifted based on the changes of like the social dynamics using the internet, et cetera? I think a lot. I think a lot. Yeah. I think. I think the yeah phones for multiple reasons have had huge effects. Like one is actual phones that people have on them physically in a club on a dance floor. Ten years ago, that wasn't a thing. So like every when you were DJing, everyone was there and they were like a bit more present and they were interacting with you and with their mates. And there was people weren't looking at phones, but they also weren't filming stuff. Like we played. We played a party for three years, I think it was, every single Sunday in King's Cross. It was Stu and I and another friend of ours, Jono, and we played this uh, this club called Kid and Caboodle. It was like on level two of Sugar Mill. And this was back when King's Cross was thriving. And Sunday night was very much a hospitality night. Um, you definitely have like young kids coming out to party, but then a lot of the hospo crowd who worked Friday, Saturday nights, they'd come in. And it was rammed every single Sunday. Till 4 a.m. Till 4 a.m. And we would just play. But yeah, I don't remember at all then phones on the dance floor. No. Like if people had phones, it was... Nokia's. Yeah. It was before... It was before... We no, were... no one's sitting in the corner of the club playing Snake. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a major thing. But that I is think a big one. The other side is 
now just people's attention spans are a lot shorter and you can you can feel that on a dance floor as well just how do you how do you approach that now just kind of got to do what you do you know like that's that's not that's we've never i mean previously preset maybe we were party djs where we'd mix super quick but that's not really how we mix it's like a lot of the how you you know the dj decisions the mixing decisions and stuff bleed into the how you present yourself as an artist and we're not turbo time unless we're on a 45 minute set at a festival and we're trying to play all our tunes we kind of like to go a little slower and slow things down and you kind of feel there's a little bit of resistance to that initially thankfully most of the time people come around and they like slow down with you and then they're kind of locked in for the ride but it's a it's a you got to work at it a lot more you have to be a lot more careful about those few initial tunes to kind of get people into the groove because otherwise they write you off pretty quick um yeah we definitely spend the first 20 to 30 minutes of any set trying to like like establish you know, as you said the groove and kind of the energy of of what we'll be doing and sometimes you come on after someone who has been playing a new song every two minutes so like you need to kind of almost do a hard reset it's also yeah. why we're big fans of kind of playing extended sets as well um if the if if it's the right venue and the right crowd like we've done these parties called stamina sessions where we play a minimum of four hours and compared to the 45 minute festival set a four hour set we approach very differently and you know you've got that time to move you know you spend the first hour just winning people over locking them in but then if you do that properly you've got them in the palm of your hand for the next three hours and it's, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, you can take some risks, step outside of the box. I think that's that's probably the main thing. Like, like people aren't necessarily taking the risks in the DJ sense that they used to because if you put one foot wrong, people kind of like switch off pretty quick. And so there's like a little bit of pressure to pump out the hits. And I know that's always been the case, but like if I, I, I definitely feel it more than ever at mm. the moment. But it's just kind of, as soon as you kind of step out of that and people realize that's not what they're going to get, yep. generally speaking, they're down for it, which is sick. Mm. For sure. Are you are you guys finding a challenge combining what you knew previously to what you know now? And like, do you guys have like creative tension where you know something might work, but you just doesn't feel right in your gut? So you don't do it, but then potentially you like lose out on some upside for the set mode project or like, how do you navigate that? I think just be true to yourself. Yeah. That's, that's that always has to be the guiding light. Like you just have to do what feels good to you, whether that's hopping on a trend or not. I think you just need to, if you're not true to yourself, it's like, imagine you make something you're not into and it pops off like how yep. torturous you know you just yeah. stitch yourself up so hard for who knows how long <laughs> like, that sounds like hell it's, I'd rather... it's, it's a pretty easy litmus test like i think we were, we were going through tunes in here the other day in the studio and we definitely play some like popular records but they're records that we love and then we'll yeah. listen to something and i think Stu and i heard it and we were like oh this would definitely work and then Stu was like yeah, but I'll feel like an idiot if I'm standing up on stage and this song is playing. It's like, true, so would I. Yeah. That's the test. That's the test. I don't, you know, like, because stuff, everything is filmed now. It's like, you can bet that you do something you're not proud of or you don't, like, truly believe in, that shit will end up online. Oh, yeah. And, like, oh, yeah. and then it's online forever. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It's wild. It's like, yeah. That's the one thing I don't love about phones. Make a mistake. You can't you know away. about it. <laughs> Constantly reminded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad. Um, well, on that note, you know, what does a successful music career look like to you guys? I like, I mean, I don't think if in the grand scheme of things we're like crazy successful, like we've had success, but I, I think, and I don't want to speak for you here, but like I, I've I'm living a life that feels successful. I like have freedom to kind of do what I want and, and do all those things and listen to music and play music and make music all day. And then tour on the weekends and play that music to people and party with them and do all that. Like that's doing that is amazing. That's it. I think if you're making, if you're making a living off your art, which we're lucky that we do, then 
that's kind of how I would define it. And then obviously that's, as you said, scalable. Like you can play bigger parties and songs can pop off harder than others. But the fact that every day we get to just either make music or go and play music to people, it's like we've very fortunately been successful for a long time, I'd say, in that regard. Mm. We're in, so it's basically freedom. Freedom. Ability to do what you please yeah. with your days and be able to share your art. And you're already there, so you feel like you've already got success. Totally, and have space. Like, because I think the reason that's so important is like freedom means you can be more creative, you can take more chances, and you can really kind of explore ideas and different vibes and different, you know, like it, it, there's something about that that is truly priceless. Um, and I, I, you know, like we've got friends that are really successful, and and there's obviously a lot of positives to that. But you you start to lose time, and mm-hmm. you don't have as much time in the studio to write music and and really dig into things and see where it takes you, and um or see friends or yeah family or you know take time off to rest and relax. It's like. It can, it, you can easily get jealous, I think, of other people's success, but what you don't realize is like, you know, I've, I've, I've heard this many times, it's like you can't just cherry pick aspects of people's success. It's either you, you, it's all of it or none of it because yeah. those people who are super successful, I'm sure there's lots of aspects that they might be jealous of things that we get to do because we have more time or what whatever it is. It's like, it's there's pros and cons to wherever you're at and it's just about navigating them and making sure that you're happy with where, where you're at, that you yeah. chose them. Yeah. And you're living the, the life conscious. that you wanted. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. You've not, you've not joined a trend that you hate. <laughs> Play yeah. music you hate. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Well, look, when back to when, when you're writing music, have you figured out a process that kind of gives you the best chance of success or is it just like randomness? Have you noticed when you're writing something that maybe while you're writing you go, oh, this this has this is a bit spicy. I feel like this could be something good, or you just completely have no no gauge on it. I think like we have we have frameworks um, that that lead to better results generally for sure. But um, what are those frameworks? It, d- it depends on the setting. So. If we're if we're working with a uh, a singer or like a songwriter, the lyricist is going to either feature or maybe not feature on the tune. We um we almost exclusively we're not like it has to be this way, but like ninety percent of the time we're in the room together because mm-hmm. um although we can't sing, we do have a lot of input on those top lines, on those lyrics and melodies, and and I think like you know when we started out collaborating with people we just make a beat send it over the internet to a singer they'd return a top line and we're like wow it's got vocals on it now cool see like that's done um yeah, yeah. And then, but like early on we were really fortunate to work with uh dutch duke dennis dallet um on white dress and he opened our eyes to that process and- amazing amazing songwriter yeah. I mean, amazing musician and songwriter but yeah he definitely i think shifted our approach to yeah. songwriting so and what like, is the different approach exactly? Like what what's the kind of source if you were to he was, pull it together? I think we were, yeah, because we didn't come from like a songwriting background, especially like lyrically, we were just kind of like, if the words and melody sound good, it's good. Whereas his approach was to come up with a really strong idea, concept, story. And then that makes the lyrics, writing the lyrics a lot easier because you're like, well, is this... Is this part of the story we're trying to tell? Yeah, I mean, uh, thinking about it now, it's just like setting an intention for the for the tune, really. Like, it's just like, and making sure you're all aligned on that fact going into it because, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to write with a lot of people over the years and when we don't do that, you can kind of get these songs that are still like, they're pleasing to the ear, but they're not particularly deep, you know, like mm-hmm. they're not going to stand the test of time. You'll listen to it a few times and then, you realize that the lyrics aren't really telling a story that you connect to or whatever it is. And, um, and then you kind of move on to the next one. But those, those tunes where all the people in the room, like all of us have agreed on something that we all have in common that we can all relate to and, and feel 
a way about uh, and then diving into that and putting that into a song like because that that then guides everything you're writing sitting down writing chords it's like is this the vibe like does this tell the story does it make me feel the way that what we just spoke about would make me feel and if not it's not the right thing so it makes the decision making process a lot more streamlined and a lot easier I think yeah and that, as you just said then Adam it's that, that is probably the biggest thing that's set us up to like write our best songs is when at the beginning of the day we we do have a strong intention because that would even be the same when we're not working with mm. another writer another voc- a vocalist or a lyricist even if it's just you and I writing a club tune I think the days when we're like this is the type of tune we're trying to write it's this vibe it's this energy it, it, it again it means that whenever you're making those decisions small ones big ones like chords baseline what type of drums they are if you have a clear intention rather than just being like does this sound cool? it's cool yeah <laughs> all, it, it, every, all of our best songs whether they're ones that kind of did well or just ones that we really like were all written in like a few hours a day yeah obviously you spend more time than producing it and finishing it but all the best ideas happened in in the same day generally within four hours not yeah. to put a time limit on it but like when the shit's popping it's popping it happens yeah. quick you know like you've really just got to record you got to get it down as fast as possible before it disappears because there's sure. magic in the air sure. and like rig ribbon talks about this heaps and it's so true when something's there like you can it's almost tangible yeah. you yeah. can feel it like everyone's excited there's this electricity in the room and it's just a matter of getting that shit down asap rather than like you know, go for lunch and you lose the vibe. Yeah. Mm. It's gone. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the thing, that be intentional. I think another interesting thing is when we were writing, when we set out initially, we would use reference tunes, which we still do, but we would try to make a song similar or like almost identical and we didn't have the skill set to actually make that happen. So we could kind of like reference these things and we'd land, we'd be trying to rip it off essentially, but because we didn't have the skill set, you would land far enough away that people wouldn't see the connection. And that kind of worked for a little bit. But then as the skill sets progressed and we've gotten better, you can't really do that because you let, you're like, oh, we just jacked that song. Like that's, <laughs> that, that is that baseline. Like we just fully, fully ripped it off. So now that intention is more important than ever because it's like, it's about the vibe. It's more of a conceptual thing than a specific, like let's make a tune like that. Like it might be, let's make it make us feel like that tune but we don't like sit down and go we're making a tune like this one anymore Mm. well i think there's a there's a lot to be said about the creative process when you begin just copying the greats and copying the people ahead of you so you get in the reps at the very least and as you get in the reps you begin to get better at it and then you begin to find your own unique voice so i think this is a very tried and true creative process that I hear across I multiple, multiple different industries, multiple different creative pursuits, <laughs> same thing. Yeah, and, uh, and it's like back to the what we were talking about with the partying and being immersed in the scene. There's like, there's something special when you're starting out. Like you're naive, you don't know the rules, so you don't know when you're breaking them or not, and you're just like tapped into the scene. Like you're so yeah. tapped in because you're living and breathing it, and that's why I think you get a lot of these. Um, younger producers coming through and they smash it out of the park because they know exactly what's what's up Mm. uh and it almost like as you get better as you as your skill set develops that whole bell curve thing you know you kind of like you start to overthink everything and you're like but it doesn't fit you know like this isn't right this isn't the right in the scale or whatever it might be Mm. and then you get to the other side of it where you stop caring about all the rules and you it's so like automatic that you can just start to express yourself freely and you have the ability to do that across multiple instruments multiple multiple ways you know your toolkit's a lot more developed and um i think fortunately we're reaching that point which is really exciting and really fun you almost go back to the the like Childlike. the freedom of and the naivety of that when you start out and it's so sick like it's mm. it's such a vibe just going in and just not having to think about setting things up and doing it just yeah. it's all automatic and you can kind of just make really good sh- sounding shit straight out of the box it's great yeah 
Have you heard? Have you read the book Mastery by Robert Greene by any chance? I'm reading it at the moment. Yeah, oh, this talks about through. this. To, this is exactly what I'm hearing. Is like yeah. his process to mastery and how you go back to spoiler alert. You basically go back to the childlike state. <laughs> totally, it's yeah. it's pretty reaffirming. I'm reading and I'm like not actually. It's it's like stuff that I intrinsically know just through the process of what we've gone through, mm. um, and it's super reaffirming. Like it's great. Mm. That is great. Do you do you feel like when you talked about the magic in the air and Rick Rubin has spoken about just putting in the reps every day and then there's, what's her name, um, The Artist Way and The War mm, of Art. Yeah, it's yep. all about you know resistance and pushing through resistance and the only way to create the spark is by having 10 days of no spark and just doing it every day do you have you found that as a reality or do you think that's the best approach to you know being consistent at, on a creative pursuit or not yeah yeah and and yeah we've sometimes very intentionally and other times slightly less intentionally like done a lot of writing in kind of blocks um we find it hard if we're like touring and kind of away every weekend and and bouncing around to then like get in here for two days and and write something new we've definitely done that in the past but i think a lot of the best writing we've done is we've gone on little writing trips some of them have been in like rural places in australia other ones have been overseas and then we've done some more recently like we wrote um a second album flux in here during like covid when there kind of was no touring and we weren't going anywhere else and then when we finished the that album tour last year i think we we're feeling pretty inspired and motivated we'd played a whole lot of shows we'd seen what had been working and what hadn't and we kind of jumped in here and we did a writing cam that was part of sweated out that went for like a week and then we just carried on and did like another kind of month's worth of writing and we're just yeah banging out a tune a day and yeah not everyone's great but out of that we got like 10 tunes and it was i think because you kind of get on that roll and when you know you're doing a tune a day you get less precious about is this going to be the next single? It's just like, well, this is just going to be whatever today's tune is, and then tomorrow we'll write a new one. And then at the end of that period, you've got 30 ideas or whatever it is, and it quite quickly becomes clear which ones stand out, you know, start finishing them, start playing them. Yeah. We, we like, we've got a process around it now after, you know, however many years of doing it, where it's, we, we used to get so caught up on a song, like, I belong here, we spent countless hours on that tune. Like I would hate, I would actually love to know, but like the amount of time we spent tweaking that track, like, and, and it's it's funny because that obviously worked. It's our most, I think it's our most successful tune, that or White Dress. Right, right up there. But um, mm, in terms of streaming commercial success. Yeah. Um, but like in that time, we could have written a hundred songs. No exaggeration. Like, we could have written a hundred different songs. What do you think would have and, been better for your long-term career, genuinely? I mean, that's the thing. I Belong is a funny one because it, it kind of, <laughs> it did <laughs> kind of, it worked. It worked. But like, I think knowing what we know now, the approach is like churn and burn, bang out at least an idea a day. And then we'll do that for kind of two weeks. And then we listen to everything. And you've had enough time and space from those demos that that initial excitement is gone and you can see the song for what it really is. And if there's something there, it, it, you know, it just hits and you're like, because the production's rough as hell, everything's rough as, and if it makes you go, ooh, you know it's worth diving into and developing and seeing where you can take it. But it just saves a lot more time, you know. You get, in a month, you can do 20 ideas, which you might get two to five tracks out of or we could have spent two weeks on a demo to realize that it's not the one and mm -hmm. then you do it again and you get to the end of the month and you might feel the same way again you're like well we just burn a month on two demos that we're not going to release mm -hmm. so it's definitely like the the reps that's how we approach those writing i think yeah writing things. it's true because now there's definitely compared to a few years back we write way more songs that won't come out or you know ne they just kind of sit there as ideas but i think 
as Stu said, through that process, if you've done 100 tracks, there's going to be 10 good ones or 20 good ones or whatever it is. And two heaps good ones. Like, but if you do, bang it, see if you just do, it's that, uh, what's that assignment? It's like the, the summer day, 30 days. Yeah. Or, or the, you know, that one class was told to make one amazing oh, clay yeah. pot. And yeah. The other yeah. class was told to make 30 as, clay ma- pot. as many as they can. As many as they yeah. can. Yeah. And yeah. which one had the better clay pot? Yeah. <laughs> just do the reps. And like, yeah. comes back to the freedom exploring. If you're making 20 tunes, you're not going to use the same sounds on all 20, or hopefully you're not. Or, or if you do, the sounds are going to start to sound pretty fucking good. You know, like you're going to figure them out and be like, oh, yeah, this is hitting now. So, like, there's, yeah, there's benefits, whatever your approach is to reps. It's, it's 100% the way. And like, don't be precious. Like, free yourself. This is fun. What we do is fun. Making music is fun. And it should always be fun. Yeah. So, like, I think people can get hung up on the, like, it's got to be perfect. Like, I'm definitely, like, a perfectionist. And that's been something I'm trying to actively not do lately. And it's just, like, just bang them out. Yeah. I think it's. I think it definitely helps that there's the two of us in here. Uh, as soon as we kind of get stuck, what the other one will kind of just help, help push it forward, you know? I think... If it's just one person going around and around, it can maybe get a bit easier to get stuck or spin your wheels a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Whereas when there's two of you, kind of keep moving. How so? What what kind of advice would you give, say, a producer listening to this now, and doesn't doesn't have the potential? You know, it's kind of like you've got a co-founder, put in a business context, but like doesn't have that person to. Um, spitball ideas off and is potentially feeling stuck what what techniques would you guys use if you were not together i reckon like this is something that we haven't had to do because of the setup the situation of having two of us and like we, we've done it to an extent but i think what would really help an individual in that setting is to have a very very clear vision on what you're trying to achieve and what you want your project to be and that and knowing that vision can be flexible and change over time but like going out knowing exactly what you like knowing where that's played and who listens to that and then creating music that fits into that world and like that doesn't necessarily have to be a scene for what you're making because like innovate if that's if you're vibing on something that's that is weird like in inverted commas like don't go with it if it feels mad but like but know what you're trying to achieve and that might be hard initially that's because really you don't, hard it's yeah. it's super hard, and I think that's like the big, the like biggest kind of defining factor of success. Really, is how crystal clear is your vision, yeah, and then how capable of you uh, are you of achieving that or like realizing that. So that's how, true. How how would you go about finding the vision if you're an upstart? You know, producer yeah. does like owns a lot of things. You know, maybe yeah. like. 20 different genres and it's got all very confusing how and like to write lots of different how do you how do you hone in write them down write everything down chuck them together and see if you can smash it all together and create something new yeah <laughs> you know or or copy copy the like tr- literally try and remake the tracks that you fucking love yeah that's that's a great way to kind of get your skill set developed into in a yeah. production sense in it but in an artistic sense i think um it's okay to like a bunch of shit. We we Definitely. between the two of us, it is a very kind of broad taste in music across sure. genres and scenes and styles, like all all of it. But just try and smash it all together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that's great advice, but like, and consume music is yeah. probably the other thing. That's probably another thing that like, um, like I don't know. I, I kind of stopped doing. I wasn't as deep on the crate digging over the last couple of years as I was when we started out and and it makes a difference if you're like mm-hmm. fingers on the pulse and you're just consuming a shit ton of music for sure. for sure yeah for sure I think another thing if if you're like a solo artist and yeah looking you know you don't have a, someone like like we do like another a partner in the band or the music project or whatever finding a little close tight network of people yeah other artists and they don't have to be making the same music as you or or whatever like we were very fortunate in the first studio we ever had um that wasn't in like one of our bedrooms was in, in this complex down in Rushcutters bay in sydney 
and there was Broken Hill House. Broken Hill House. Shout out Broken Hill House. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, Damn, it was a special place. It was us, Cassian, Flight Facilities, Pete and Dark. Benny, Dutch Duke, Benny, Nikki Knight, Boys, oh, and Tenzin. Tenzin. There was so many people oh, there. Yeah. It was and wild. We would go and play all of them, our stuff. And as soon as we would walk into one of those rooms and play someone something, we would listen to it with different ears. They would often have feedback. A lot of the time, it was stuff that we hadn't thought of. Look, I reckon 80% of the time it's stuff that you'd be like, oh, that's great advice. 20% of the time you're like, no, nah, I don't agree with that. But it's also important to like know when you get that advice that you don't agree with. You don't just blindly follow everything. Yeah, blindly yeah. follow everything. But I think that was a great help for us, especially in those like initial years Yeah, when we were really finding our feet musically and as producers and just making our stuff sound good and feel good. And Yeah, and you said it like, there's the value in getting to hear your own music for the first time a second time. You know, when you play <laughs> it to someone, all that shit that you were too lazy to actually act on jumps out. And you're like, <laughs> oh, why oh, why didn't I do that before playing it to this person? And that's like, that's almost more valuable than the feedback a lot of the time. We'll, we'll kick up on a tune in here for a day, a week, whatever. And then a mate will come by because we're like going for dinner with them or something. And we'll be like, oh, we're... To, so like what are you working on we're like oh we'll play you this thing we play it and literally Sue and I both whip out our notepads and start writing stuff down all these things that we like hadn't necessarily heard or as you said have been too lazy to act on as soon as you've got another person in the room listening to it it feels completely different it's actually crazy the effect that that has and that yeah. person sometimes doesn't even have to be like another no. musician it can just be like a mate and yeah like, mm. oh this jumps out at me now. That bit needs fixing. It's huge. It's huge. And it's better better that, like, be embarrassed in front of a small group of people that you trust and you're okay being vulnerable with rather than putting it on Spotify and having the world judge you, being like, what is this shit? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was an Dude. interesting thing with our, se- with our second album that was written in such a vacuum. Like, yeah, it was, it was written in 2020 and 2021. We barely played any shows those years. We weren't, yeah, touring and testing music on dance floors, but we were. You weren't even really seeing people, you know. So yeah. like, we weren't going over to mates' houses and playing them demos no. and stuff, which is d- definitely a big part of, you know. If I go and see my family, they'll be like, "What are you be working on?" And I'll just play it on the speaker and get my brother and sister's opinion, etc. Like, they're not musical at all, but you quickly get a gauge of, oh, this one, that one, and I think when we put out that album, not that we're like we're super proud of it, but it was just such an introspective album. It was like. Nick and Stu. <laughs> mm-hmm. There wasn't much external output, uh, external input at all, like during that process. And then I think when we put out the album and started touring it and like playing it on dance floors, we're like, oh, this isn't really as much of a dance floor album as I think we kind of had in our heads. Mm. Yeah. Because we'd just written it in this little dark room with no windows. Do you think for the art's sake, if you could do that again, but be able to play it out, would you have or would you? are, are you happy just leaving it as it no. is? No. It's a snapshot. Every, every, every kind of thing you work on is a snapshot of you and your life at that point in time. Um, I'm super proud of that album. I fucking love that album. Yeah, did I? Um, it's, I- yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, no, wouldn't change everything. Have no regrets. No. Move it's, on. It's great. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, yeah, it's, it's then inspired us. Like we got off the back of that and as I said, we like toured that album. We kind of, Toured it pretty extensively right after we put it out last year. And then after three months of touring, we were like itching to get back in the studio and write new stuff and took away all of the learnings. And yeah, we'd we'd kind of like pre COVID, a little bit of context like pre COVID, we'd written our first album and built a live show where we were performing. Yeah, I remember seeing you guys in the stuff. Yeah, that was sick. That was a great show. That was a great show. show. Later shows, not so great. We had some technical <laughs> issues, so we can dig into that later if you want. But um, basically, like, we'd made the call. We'd done the live thing. We loved it, but it was stressful. We're not, we're not performing musicians. We're studio mus- musicians, you know? Like, we're, we're, we're producers. It's, that's kind of what we do. And we're, and we're DJs. That we were, although we got comfortable with the live thing and it was a very sick, like, exciting new way to present the Setmo project, we realized that we're much better DJs than we are 
like Life. performing musicians. So we're like, okay, cool. We're going to go back to that. We're not going to do the live post COVID whenever things come back, we're going to, we're going to DJ. And then, but then we wrote this, yeah, this introspective album that probably would have been better presented in a live kind of setup that we'd already said no to. And then mm-hmm. it, it was a really, uh, like, uh, a, stark, a, a, mo- a stark moment of realization for us where we were like, okay, well, if we're DJing, we need to make club music, mm. which is what we, this project, we started out making club music. Mm. And then we kind of, I, I don't know, I guess White white Dress was the first track of ours that got Triple J support and started to, I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but like that led us down a path of song-based dance music yep. which was really fun and it's kind of how we got to the live show and stuff but then having that room to reflect through covid and and then post covid playing the music that we'd written we were like what are we doing here you know like mm-hmm. we, we know we want to dj but we can't we're making edits of all of our own songs just to fit into our dj sets mm-hmm. and then it was a really kind of awesome positive thing to realize and be like okay well we know what we want to do and we know the music we love so we just have to make that music. It's kind of that simple. And that was, you know, coming back to the having the clear vision, I feel like we've got a clearer vision than ever. It's true. Around the project. So we've was tried there, a lot of things. For sure. Was it was there a really big value in just creating space to reflect? And how it's important huge. do you think that is in somebody's music career? How often should they be looking to just do nothing and reflect on the direction? I think to a degree, daily, if you can. Even yeah. if that's like a 10-minute meditation or something like that. Yeah, so. I think it's, yeah, it's. I'd, I'd agree. It's less about every year you should take a month off to reflect because it's, it's, I think it is way more about just very frequently pausing. And again, we're lucky that there's a two of us that we can just be like, okay, what, how do we feel about this? And what, whatever it is, the, the tunes or the direction or what we're doing over the next month or three months or six months. But um, it can be very close to get like super zoomed in or like what's right in front of you. But you need to often frequently take that step back to just be like, is this serving the greater goal or what we're trying to achieve here? Have you, um, have you with your ideas, you know, you briefly mentioned that you're putting together a ton of ideas and, Many of them are, sh- you know, potentially shit, and then a few of them are great. Like, hey, look, none of them are something. shit. Okay, they're all really good. Well, it's just some are better than others. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> some, of, few of them, like most of them are world class. Some of them are super world class, and then the couple Thank are you. super mega world class. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, have you? gone away had some ex- have you, do you have a, a story an example of a track that you've made and then six months later or whenever you've had some very unique specific experience that has sparked something and you've gone wait i'd know what to do with that track or have you just continued to move forward and never looked back uh no we do revisit stuff sure we do revisit sure. stuff we put out earlier this year could i be yeah it was a song that we'd like basically forgotten about yeah um i wouldn't say it's like uh necessarily spurred by a like an event or something like that but um yeah it like well that track could i be was something we wrote i think back in like 2018 yeah but then we were like zoning in or writing our first album and it was a bit clubbier and I just think we, I think more than anything, we kind of forgot about it. It didn't have a vocal on it at that point. We wrote it with, um, with a guy named Kerr, Casey Lights, uh, out of Scotland. Scottish. He's an amazing producer. Um, And it was also one of the first times we collabed with a producer. Because we generally don't, we generally write with singers or top line writers, um, vocalists. Because we're kind of like we got the production side covered, but um, I think we wrote this thing that felt really good, but it didn't have a vocal, and we were so vocal led at that point in time that we were like, without a vocal, it's kind of, it's nothing. Um, and we ended up fi- like opening. 
think I don't even know why we listened to it. I think we were just like kicking through old demos and typed yeah. it in, in iTunes, just typed in the like thing that we put on demos and all these things came up and just flicking through stuff because there's a lot there. And that was like, oh, what's this? Like, this, is good. <laughs> this is mad. Because <laughs> it was just a, like a day's work. It was just like we wrote yeah. it and then bounced it, went onto the iTunes and then forgot about it. Yeah. And then when we heard it, we're like, we should finish this or at least, you know, play it out, see how it goes. So we kind of produced it up. And that was probably the tipping point when we then played it in a couple of sets and went, yeah, this is definitely a thing. For sure. And it made it way clearer kind of as we finished it, being like what it needed. That's one of the beautiful things about DJing and, and playing dance music. I think more so than live music is you have the opportunity to test stuff all the time. And yeah. people don't know you're testing it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slip it in there. It's like, yeah. it's and you're like, oh, needs more low end. Just crazy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this one doesn't work. No, no, I don't know. Sure. Just had this one on the stick. Don't know who made this one. No, that's, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so funny. That's true. It's a really good point. And it's like, kind of comes back to the, I think the skill set had developed as well. Like maybe we weren't capable of bringing that tune or like getting it to the place where it needed to be to, to feel really good. And then a few years had passed, got better at producing and whatnot and opening it up. It was, it was really clear to us what, what it needed. And that was a day's worth of work and we did it. And it's like thinking back to, I belong here. I think we knew it needed to be developed. It wasn't quite right, but we didn't have, the knowledge or the skill set to just like clearly define what what it was lacking and then how to kind of get that get it in there mm. um and that's why that song took two years to finish or whatever it however long it took but um yeah there's something about that i think always revisit your old ideas because there's that like like what we were talking about before there's that sometimes you you have really good ideas when you're starting out you just don't know how to how to kind of see it all the way through totally mm. it's like go back we, we always we always say it's like you chuck your demos in a graveyard and they're stripping for parts you know there's always like like a, a junkyard essentially you just kind of like go this thing that sound or this line or whatever is awesome and i would definitely not think to do that now mm. but pull it out and then hit it with your like brushed up prod and it's mad do you i want to double click on the actual demos in itunes what tagging system are you using because i've never heard of this so oh. are you just like just i mean it's changed over the years it's just like a little code it's instead of writing semo it's just sm so yeah. if we search sm and then it's like v now it's like v1a but like it used to be one point dot two point dot whatever whatever it was and so you just punch in sm when a song's finished of ours when we get a master that says semo but if you punch in sm into the itunes it's all demos. comes up yeah it's good it's a good way to approach it to just tag things um and come back to them that's that look that's one piece of advice for any up-and-coming producers listening is like be organized be diligent with your tagging save as frequently every time you open <laughs> a session save as and ch like so f for us it's v if we do something you save the, the name working title v1a if we open that session the next day you save it as v1b because it's very easy to like overproduce things and like mm. basically like produce the vibe out of the track and sometimes you'll listen to an old demo and be like this is better this feels better like yeah sonically it might not be as polished or whatever but like this thing just feels good and you want to be able to go back to that point in the track if you just kind of like constantly saving over things and you listen to something and you're like it used to be better but i can't go back there especially in the early days of production where your skills aren't there like mm. just be organized please it will benefit you later in life we so many times with our tunes that we've worked on lots and lots we've like got to version 10 12 15 whatever it is and then gone oh version three is the one yeah like <laughs> but it's good to go you needed to get do all those yeah. questions to figure that out but... go too far to know you've gone too far yeah and there's yeah. no harm in it there's no risk in it it's kind yeah, of freeing it's... yeah you know? and who knows there might be something interesting that you take from that version 15 to something completely different oh man i belong here we smashed two versions together it's true yeah we right. did like this kind of bubbly one there's a vip that's out that kind of didn't get a lot of attention and i think I don't remember if we took drums directly from that, but that inspired the, the original drums on 
I belong here were very live, very soft. Uh, not that they're particularly hard in the in the mastered version, but we kind of went. There's like a, a beauty in the live instrumentation in the bass and the piano and all that stuff. But like these drums are soft; they're not hitting. And so like making the house start version that was like had a little synthy arp and stuff. And that art then got carried over. To- yeah, true, yeah. true. So it's like, do the versions because you never know. Like, you'll surprise yourself. For Happy sure. accidents and whatnot. For sure. Definitely. I uh, I just want to do a bit of a recap on yeah, what a beginning producer sh- should possibly do to make the most out of their time and energy when they're right, like starting out. So it's write often, mm. you know, write new projects daily. Would you say it's better for the skill sets to take a new idea every day make something completely different potentially than the pathway of, you know, spending two weeks on a track when you're just beginning, maybe you're not really trying to polish and release, but you're just getting started. Would you say that's probably a better option? I, th- I still or do you think, get different still, skill sets. I still think so. I think as soon as you're forcing yourself to kind of just like, if you know that you're working on something today that you've started and you're not going to be able to work on it tomorrow, it kind of forces, unless you just want to bounce like a 16 bar loop, it kind of forces you to keep moving and not get too caught up in, you know, compressing a kick drum or whatever it is. If you know you got to like, we're always like, okay, we need that bounce that we're going to put into iTunes, SMV1A, and we're not going to bounce it if it's 20 seconds. Yeah. We don't we don't bounce like unarranged ideas. We don't bounce a loop because there's like this thing that's not our concept, but demo artists. You know, if you listen to something too much, it's very hard to change it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you like, if you bounce that loop, you're going to listen to that loop 20 times. And then when you open that session up, you're going to be like, but it sounds right. So I don't know what to do. I have no idea where to go. But, yeah. So I, what's the I, would, I would say like dedicate the time. So like the biggest thing for people starting out is they've probably got a job. They're probably doing something else that takes up a lot of their time. So you kind of like allocate that, that block to making music realize that sometimes inspiration is not going to hit and like something might not come you look at that loop and you're like this is shit i feel shit about myself i i like what am i doing i want to quit that's that's going to be part of the process and just go and then what do you do it's it's not coming today what's my weakness what's something i don't know how to do and here's like another one when you're working on tunes and you hit a roadblock that kind of ruins your flow because of a lack of ability write it down keep working on that song at that point in time but write it down and then when you find yourself in a session where it's just not coming happens to us as well like even now then it's like okay cool well i've dedicated this block to making music i'm just going to get better at making music today i'm not going to write a song i'm going to so you youtubing you know like youtubing marking around jump in a bit of sound design you know like open up whatever vst you've gotten most recently or whatever you're using if it's serum or whatever like and learn it read the manual it's boring but no one does it and when you do that <laughs> you know how to use a, a plugin way better it like, that shout actually dude it's and it's like it's it's necessary if you want to be good at this you've got to know how to use the shit and yeah. the only way to do that is to do the research do the learning spend the time like and it's when time's limited don't bang your head against the wall if it's not coming just get better. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Just do better. <laughs> Just do better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so do you, you know, I'm a pretty listy guy and I've noticed when I, I did a few sessions just before I came to America and um, do you write lists as you're writing tracks of things you need to do for that track? It's like, oh, we're writing, you know, we're writing this track and it's like, oh, now, okay, I know. You know, we're going to end the session, but like, I know I need to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G before I come back. Is that something you do or you just intrinsically yeah. have it in your head? <clears throat> yeah, we do that all the time. Yeah, that's kind of how we start the day. It's so um, to do you know, f- Fresh ears, the demo itis thing, like fresh ears are invaluable. You only get them kind of once a day on an idea. It's the first time you listen to that tune. Normally, like when we've written stuff, we've given it space. So like we'll try not to work on the same idea two days in a row unless we're really close to finishing it. And you play that tune and you brain dump. Every single thing that jumps out of you through that first play, you write that down on your list and there's your job for the day. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It can be quite dangerous not doing that, to be honest. If you open a session and you don't know what it is that you're actually trying to do, 
especially if the idea is already formed, you can just go around in circles where you're like, is this getting better or worse or just different? That's when you polish the vibe out of stuff. Yeah. Big time. Oh, yeah. On that note, what is the vibe? <laughs> <laughs> the million dollar question. The, vi- the vibe is the intention. That's what you set at the beginning of the process. What is this? What are you trying to achieve with this tune? Is it an introspective headphone tune or am I trying to rock a dance floor? Am I trying to rock a club, festival, whatever it might be? Am I trying to make people happy? Am I trying to make people sad and dance? Who knows? Whatever it is, like that's up to the crying person. Over, crying over the crying on the dance floor. Yeah, it's a real a thing. Times. <laughs> Fuck it, eh? But um, I think that's the vibe. You know, like whatever you've defined as the vibe is the vibe and just mm. keep keep sticking to that. Yeah. So you you said you polish you might like polish out the vibe. Mm. Do you think there's a there's a value in just like some rawness the music sure. like some some naturalness to it that doesn't that needs to be kind of like a little bit chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. Because as as you were saying before, it's like often you'll do things that aren't like right, but then you know sometimes if you fix those things if it's that the bass is too loud or something is you know w- w- whatever it is it's like sometimes those are the things that make those tracks just feel great um there's obviously like a point where stuff can just be wrong where it's like a bass is 10 db too loud but mm. if if something is feeling good and it's working we're, we've had stuff that like feels good and works we've played it out on dance floors like this is good and then we're like we'll kind of polish it up a bit more and you're like just doesn't feel it's not hidden doesn't feel the same mm. and we'll like go back so it, it's a fine balance of yeah as you said knowing what you're trying to achieve but then yeah just uh, there's definitely something about leaving a bit of that rawness in I think yeah. all of our tunes that we really like and resonate with there's stuff in there that it's like not not perfect but that's mm. kind of the whole point that's the thing yeah mm. uh, like again New producer tip, don't EQ everything. <laughs> it doesn't need it. EQing, it's like you're fixing problems. It, it's not a like a an essential thing that has to happen. Like one thing we're getting better at is just leaving shit alone. Yeah. Mm. Get get like the best sounds you can and let them be great because they're great. Don't like force it into being something it's not. And less Leave is it better. Less is, less is always more. <laughs> I thought more as well. <laughs> make it what's that what's that quote it's like make it simple as possible but no simpler and it's like an Einstein quote or something yeah that's a good quote that is good uh, I don't know if it's Einstein but could have been me I'm just... rapid <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, I want to move into a rapid fire but there's a couple of more a couple of key questions that still I think would be really valuable to understand for you know potential producers and people in the creative field so you spoke about you know, being anxious about music and anxious about what you're putting out. I know a lot of people in the music industry, a lot of up and coming producers, DJs, writers, etc., that make things are good, but just have this crippling anxiety about mm. trying to make it perfect and not getting anywhere because they try and make it perfect. What story or example do you have in in either of your experiences that have will allow someone to potentially overcome that i think a big one that jumps out to me is like we've we've put out a lot of music over the years like you know dozens and dozens of songs maybe i don't even know how many songs to put out at least four S- 65 Six- <laughs> yeah yeah there you go I was in the, actually no, no, more, <laughs> more but that's like including people's remixes of our tunes um, yeah, yeah probably like 40 and <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely we are definitely perfectionists and potentially work on things longer than necessary. Definitely do. At times. But the, yeah, the, sorry, the, where I'm trying to get to or the takeaway is the one, there's songs that we thought would be huge. We're like, this is, this is it. And it's done very little. And then other songs that we maybe didn't have, like, we thought they were maybe more niche or, you know, weren't, didn't have the same kind of potential. And then they've just gone way harder than others. And I think the takeaway from that is just like, just keep going, just keep putting out the tunes because once that, the day that song is released, 
you know, there's obviously things you can do to help promote and market the music, but a lot of it is just out of your hands. S- songs will just do what they're going to do. People will love them and pick them up and radio might play them or streaming might crank it, whatever it is, but it's like a lot of that is out of your hands. Mm. So it's to be less precious. And obviously you want everyone to be the one, so you need to have that approach of just like making it as good as it can be, but then also just realizing, taking that step back, being like, well... I think it's quite freeing to know that it's like, well, this is just the next one because then yeah. there's another one coming. That's a great shout because mm-hmm. like if it doesn't hit two weeks later, it's gone. And do you want to spend a year on something that potentially is forgotten about in two weeks? Or And not saying like, I mean, you said it, make it as good as you can, but it's just because it feels like your entire world at the, at the while you're working on it, it's just a moment in time. And yep. there's going to be plenty more. So just kind of like do the best you can. And once it's there, once you're making tiny tweaks and you can't tell the difference between your demos from day to day, it's finished. Yeah. It's done. Mm. Just put it out. Share it with some friends. First, if you're really scared, if you're really scared, put it on a forum and get blasted <laughs> by strangers. <laughs> Have them tell you it's shit cop all the negative that's because there's so many haters online and then you like kind of you know you build up your armor and it won't hurt you if for whatever reason the public says it but like as long as you're making stuff that you believe in and you fuck with like just put it out get it as good as you can kind of quickly and roll because the longer it is since its inception talking about the magic the electricity in the air, like the further from that moment you are before you release it, like the the more crippling that imposter syndrome and that perfectionism gets, you kind of want to move relatively quick, as quick as you can without compromising on quality. For sure. Nice. Mm. Nice. Do you, um, you spoke about when you're releasing music, you kind of just let it be. Uh, it is what it is and it's in the world and it will be what it is, right? Um, how much of a tr- of a track success comes down to hustle versus just like the chips falling where they may? Great question. This is a this is a really good question. I reckon the one thing we've learned about the business side of music is being ready to respond, be proactively really? reactive. I think. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think you can do a lot of like pre-planning marketing rollout and stuff but like nick said you don't know what's going to hit you could you can like have everything perfect ready to roll out have a bulletproof release plan and you do it and then it falls flat and you've just spent all this time and money and all this energy on something that doesn't really eventuate too much or you can drop the track that fucking pops that you never expected but you know what to do when it pops Mm. so what do you do when it pops Make a music video. Don't make a really? video. Don't make the music video before the track's out. <laughs> Only make a music video if someone's going to pay for it. That's right. not okay. you. Yeah. They're like Jesus. It, look, music videos are sick to watch. <laughs> In terms of marketing and whatnot, like it's not. But it's probably better ways to spend your money. ROI. <laughs> <laughs> but like, generally speaking. Um, if something really pops, you're going to have a lot of people knocking on your door. Um, have, have people that you trust close to you that can give you advice. And that can be really hard when you're starting out because you probably don't have those networks, but, um, that's why it's like important to foster those little kind of your your circles because, um, there'll be a lot of hungry sharks coming for you and, uh, you can get fucked over pretty quick. Uh, in this industry so like and not not to be negative i think it's just like just just be ready and move fast um and find someone even if it's yeah like if it's a label that you love that you you kind of see doing the right thing constantly like maybe they're the first port of call they might not be able to give you the advances that a major label could give you or like sell the dream like these big management acts can but like um, I don't know. I think just kind of stick to the plan, stick to your gut, um, but do be ready to like do as much, 
double down hard, do mixes, do interviews, do collaborations. You know, a lot of opportunity is going to come to you very quickly and you want to jump at everything that comes at you because a month later, you might not be hot anymore. And then mm-hmm. you're kind of back to where you were. There's like, and, and coming back to your blog house edit that popped off, you know, if you do the right things shortly after mm-hmm. there's a shitload of heat, like you go viral, you can, you can set yourself up for life. Genuinely. Mm-hmm genuinely it's just kind of keep your wits about you if if you're lucky enough to find yourself in that situation and you're getting contracts pushed to you from a record label get a lawyer to look over them yeah that's a big one that's a huge one yeah yeah it might seem like a big expense you know a few grand initially but like if stuff's popping like that that money won't seem that significant yeah, yeah. Few in grand, for 100 grand down the line yeah exactly. i've learned that's yeah. the thing i've learned the hard way in, in business over the last 10 years that's when it'd be gone the cost of the lawyers at the start are worth their weight in gold at the end. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes negotiate their fee to be paid by what, if you're going to sign with a label or there's an advance, get the label to pay their legal fee so you're not out of pocket because a lot of the time that's a pretty prohibitive expense for an up and coming mm-hmm. artist. Like that's a good good tactic. Find someone that'll, that'll do that for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, find music lawyers. Don't just find your mates, your dad's mate who's a lawyer. <laughs> <Stuff>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look them up, hit them up. They're going to seem expensive, but they know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I remember I was looking through an old messenger thread with Dom Dollar. Right? And he, when I told him, when I showed him this track, he was like, I'm talking, this might have been like 2013. And he goes, This is awesome. Now just release a track a month and you're set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. release another track. And, uh, um, mate, and then still look true. At he's still true. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah true, truer than ever. <laughs> yeah. Last question before the rapid fire. How do you guys go about maintaining a strong partnership relationship? Hey, it's a good question. Hey, it's a good people, question. people often ask me this and I, it's it's been so natural. We've known each other for so long that there's, there's I don't even know, there's no real, don't know. no real secret or techniques. Like I think we just get along really well, which is obviously the most important thing but like people often ask as well like oh have you guys had any like big blow-ups over the years and it's like not really (laughs) um what do you think it comes down to like realistically if it's super easy what is it (laughs) having similar values yep i think is a big one you know like and it's kind of esoteric but like what's what we find what we feel like moral having similar morals and whatnot, you know, like it may as well make similar decisions on things. It's generally like we're kind of talking details rather than big picture stuff because we already have, we're aligned on the big picture things. Um, And I think just like having respect for one another, if, if one of us, you know, a lot of the time, if one of us feels really strongly on something, you just kind of go, okay, cool, run with it. You know, like, I, I don't necessarily agree with you in this point, but I can feel your passion around this particular thing. Yeah. So so do your thing. Yeah. Like, go hard. I'm not going to get in your way here. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But also, like, it's, yeah, case by case. Things do change. Relationships change. It's it's a tough one. It's it's kind of the same as, um and like, a partner, like a partner. Mm. It's very true. It's, it, it is, yeah. Definitely. Communication's important. Like, it's, I don't know. Yeah. I also think. refer to my, Christy, my wife, and then Stu, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. I love but that. But no, it's it's true. It's like it's like any relationship like that, uh, you know, really close relationship, like a a brother or a sister or a spouse or whatever. It's like you, you need to treat them with respect and and yes communication is key and i think yeah we we spent so much time together that like we've we've been through a lot you know good and bad and Mm. personal personally like individually and then together as as a group slash band so yeah there's a lot of a lot of history there and i think i think remembering like looking back at stuff looking back at wins and failures and things like that always helps and celebrating the wins together well, it's, it's funny because like a lot of the time when when you're winning, life's moving pretty quick and you don't necessarily get the opportunity to. And so like 
recently we've I feel like we've been reflecting more than ever. And there's something really nice about that. You know, you kind of look back and there are moments that were big fucking wins for us that we didn't necessarily like sell it. We didn't have a chance to celebrate because it was on to the next, you know, it's mm-hmm. like we got to keep rolling and it's nice to look back and go like, how good was that? Or how hard was that? And like, how good that we made it out the other side and we're still doing this. Mm-hmm. It's like, we, we, yeah, we've been through some serious ups and downs and it's like the fact that we're still here is, is a big thing. Well, on that note, what what was like the biggest pinch me moment for you guys? What happened? I've got one in mind. Um, Go, Stewie. Uh, Listen out, Sydney 2019. Yep. It was the end of, not quite the end, but very close to the end of the live show run. Um, We had it dialed. It was probably the first time we were feeling really comfortable and confident on stage and we could actually like stop stressing and enjoy performing um yeah able to soak it up a little bit more as well i think like yeah i think a lot lot of those initial shows were just like you know heads down trying to play the parts (laughs) correct in time by that stage we'd loosened up a little bit and i definitely remember some moments on stage where you know i could be playing and also just looking out to the crowd and that, yeah, hometown show. Fucking heaps of people. So many How many people, people do you holy. think were there? Like at least 10,000. It was wow. a sea of people. It was huge. It was, the big, it was probably the biggest crowd we've ever played to. I think so. Um, and that being at high, like there's some Splendor players, that Splendor show that you referred to. Mm. That was like, cool that was, that was That's a few, a few right up right. there. Yeah. But like hometown show, the live show was hard work. The album leading into that was really hard work. It had been like kind of two years of really intense, super long days, like 12 hours in the studio, grinding, figuring things out, learning mm-hmm. learning so much to make it all work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the real moment where it all came together and it was like the, the fruits of your labor. It was, mm-hmm. it, was, it was really, really sick. We were pretty elated after that show buzzing <laughs> buzzing yeah um, do, you, do you guys have a standout kind of like story or like a um fan feedback that you've gotten on a track about like an impact your music or a show that you've done as now, well, somebody fu- i mean there's there's there are lots there heaps, yeah. finally enough just but off the back of that listen out show that Stu was just talking about recently like in the last couple of months I was at a venue in Sydney and a girl like recognized me and came up to me and was like, you're from Seven, right? And I was like, yeah, what's your name? And then I started chatting. And then she said to me, she goes, I remember the very first time I saw you. And I was like, where was that? And she was like, listen out in Sydney back in 2019. And I was like, oh, that was a great show. And she goes, that was the first festival I'd ever attended and I walked in the gates just as you guys were starting and I ran over to the stage. You were playing Surrender, which was the opening track of our of our album, but also of that of that show. And she was like, I wasn't really I'd never really heard or experienced dance music in a live setting before. And she was like, and that made me fall in love with dance music. And I've like, yeah. still been going to like shows and concerts and club shows ever since. And I was like, That's wow. Bad. <laughs> wow, that's Give me phenomenal. shivers. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Wow. It, it was, it was, it was crazy, and she was so, so nice and and just like, you know, she almost was like, "Oh, is it okay if I come and talk to you?" I'm like, oh, "What do you mean? Of course, please tell me." <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a really nice experience and that's super good. and super recent as well. So that's mad. That stands out. That another is great. One, another one that I definitely want to mention is um, this lovely couple from where are they they're from. I think they're from the Goldie. Yeah, Gold Coast. I can't yeah. remember specifically. Um, came and saw us. Uh, we played a show on the Goldie on a boat yacht club. And it was really gnarly weather. There was a storm. So we, the boat didn't even leave the wharf. Uh, and that was their first time seeing us, right? Yeah. So I went across the project, went across the music. They they'd saw us perform, heard White Dress, and fell in love with it. And... Uh, old mate proposed to his now wife to white dress 
the oh. full thing, all the like rose petals out, oh. like fully surprised. Like it was, it was filmed. Yeah. Beautiful proposal. We got to send the video. And we're just like, wow, this is incredible. Like that's, that's special. And then to get even better, his at the time fiance got in touch with our booking agent and was like, can you come and play our wedding? It's a really small thing, but we would be so like, I would love to surprise my, my soon to be yeah. husband with you at our wedding. And so we did it. We went along. They basically and eloped and just got married. Um, they're both indigenous. So they did a full indigenous ceremony, like in the bush first. And it was like just them and, the kind of the elders and whatnot, I think. Yeah, had, like, and then was went and had like a nice lunch at this winery. Just the pair of them, they were like, "We want to just, you know, I respect this as well." It's like we're getting married. We want it just to be about us two. Yeah, I think it was like immediate family. There were maybe like a Something dozen like people or like twenty, no more than twenty people. Like it was this real small thing. So then they had this lunch at the winery, and then after. They finished the lunch. They walked down to this nice little lake area where they were going to take, take some photos and stuff. And we were just set up there and started playing music. And she obviously knew what was happening, but he had no idea. And walking down and seeing his face and seeing it like, at first he was like, What's they were kind of, they were behind a tree. <laughs> I just remember him crashing down with like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> It was it was amazing, and then we basically just DJ to them and a few of their mates for a couple of hours, and they were having the best time, and so were we. It was it was wicked. It couldn't have been like polar opposite to a massive crowd to listen out to this yeah. like super intimate thing, but being like a part of that just because of our music was so wild, very special. Yeah, and we've like kept in contact with them. They've since had a child, come to shows on the Gold Coast since we've been back up there. Like we keep it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's mad. Did they did they name it, like the child Nick or Stu? Seppo, Seppo, Seppo. It's awesome. And what have you guys taken from that? Like that's that's pretty, they're pretty impactful moments for people's lives. Huge. I think it just reminds you that, yeah, what we're doing is 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 having a positive impact on people. And to just give it just keep going, yeah. yeah. Write music that like means something. Yeah, don't just write it for the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, I love that. Thank you for sharing those stories. That's that's amazing. Um, the yeah, I got shivers and seriously got shivers. So it's it's yeah. really really cool. No, thanks for letting me share them. Like I love telling that story. Yeah, it's so, like it's so, you know, it's kind of again just reliving those big wins, remembering yeah. them. It's sick. Cool. yeah, yeah. Hey, just uh, coming up for a couple of like final general questions. Um, wh- what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you guys? Oh, Can't say to your mum. That's <laughs> a tough one to answer. I'm grateful for anyone that takes time to teach me things. I yeah. always feel like anyone that takes that selflessly takes time out of their day, no benefit to themselves to just like impart some knowledge. Um, I'm always super grateful for that. That always feels extremely kind mm. yeah yeah I can't think of anything specific like as, as many people that fall into that category take too long to name everyone but for sure yeah. so Nick anything no no one one situation is jumping out of me but I do think I'm very fortunate to have like a super I'm super close with all my family my mum and dad brother and sister I have a very loving wife and husband as well and like i just have like a, a small super tight crew that i think like are always looking out for me and have my best interests at heart and i definitely feel just super fortunate to have that in my life because i know there's lots of people that don't and like yeah well i mean maybe it's partially a um cultivation of the decision making that you've done to get yourself to that point like you have true. to main, build and maintain these relationships. It's true. They don't happen yeah. by themselves. They don't happen by themselves. So is it luck or is it effort, mm. energy? Maybe a little both. A little bit of, little bit of pepper. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and if you guys could, you know, you can individually answer these as well. And if you could only recommend like a one book or a podcast for somebody to, to read, that would be the most impactful thing they could 
consume, what would it be? There's a there's a book that I read uh, many years ago, and I have reread. It's got it doesn't have a great title, but it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a great book by Dale Carnegie. It's written like I don't know, almost a hundred years ago, which I think shows it stood the test of time. But basically, that book, and I vividly remember reading it about ten years ago. Basically, that book is just about like how to be a nice person, mm. and yeah. Yeah, so the, the title does not... Ter- terrible title. Yeah, no, but it's right. basically just like how to interact with other humans and be a nice person, which I think is more important than ever right now as we kind of like live our lives a little bit more detached, like we're more connected than ever digitally, but then potentially less connected, you know, in a real life setting mm-hmm. in, the, in the analog world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember reading that book and it affecting the way that I then like interacted with other people, both, you know, people I knew well and close to me and and complete strangers and just teaches you how to be a good person, be a nice person. Yeah, that's a good answer. I I reckon mine would be, if it's not the Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which I find extremely useful, I've been rereading it like kind of once a year for the last three years. Um in a creative sense, the war of art, mm. um, Stephen Pressfield, that great book, book Let you know definitely, the pod. yeah, it changed my life. Cause I like gnarly imposter syndrome, such a perfectionist and just like that introducing the, the idea of the reps, mm. whole resistance, like overcoming resistance and just showing up every day. I found it so easy to escape that discomfort by just avoiding the work um and that kind of really kicked my ass in the gear i think yeah i've read i've read somewhere a little while ago that kind of changed the way i approach a lot of procrastination um around procrastination being a trauma response and the first time it's the first time i've ever heard that and now that i see it i like I, i see there's a you know, let's just say I have a difficult email to write or I have something challenging. Generally, it's something hard and my first reaction mm. is to procrastinate because it hurts. Yeah. The idea of doing sure. this hurts and there's like a reaction. You're avoidant. So yeah, yeah, it's an avoidant. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. with the moment I realized, with the moment I came across that idea, realizing that it's, that, it, that it's potentially a trauma response, it's like, okay, when I feel procrastination, it's like, what am I... What what reaction am I having here? As opposed to just being like, oh, I can't be bothered doing it. It's like, no, it yeah. is deep. No, you're you're scared reaction. of something. I'm scared. What of something. What are you afraid of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah! It's interesting, yeah. and it's That's allowed. Deep. You, yeah, dude, and it's allowed like, me to like process things and move forward quicker now. <laughs> yeah, because like procrastination's a, a tough one. Hey, like it's such a universal thing, and like coming back to the getting better, like learning. The production stuff when you can't make a song like just get better at production or whatnot i think constructive forms of procrastination have been my personal way of overcoming that knowing that you're still working towards that ultimate goal but just in a slightly different way mm-hmm. but i actually prefer what you've just said I, th- I can't remember the philosopher but it's that dude talking about anxiety and how it's like you just have to lean into it and listen to mm-hmm. it um because that is that's it that's how you get better and grow and live a, a truer happier life it's just your body telling you like ah <laughs> you need to work on this <laughs> yeah, well. yeah and um are there, is there anything you guys are interested sorry excited about at the moment that you'd like to let anybody in on yes yeah ah, the main thing is uh we've kind of been very busy in here finishing music there's a whole lot of music that's um pretty much done we've been if you've seen if you come to a show over the last few months you've definitely heard a whole bunch of it yeah um we've kind of been finishing lots of things all at the same time which is an exciting feeling to have like not just like oh the next song's done it's like the next few are kind of done um Mm -hmm. and we're pumped to get them out because based off the response we've been getting playing them it's yeah yeah they're, they're decent I think <laughs> yeah. they're above average. No, they're above world class. <laughs> yeah, not to toot our own horn, but it like when you know no one knows a record because you've made it and not released it, and it gets a gets a good response. It it's that's super validating. Yeah, and yeah, 
yeah that's <laughs> really exciting we're pumped uh, we got a shitload of it yeah so when's all this what's the timeline on this stuff kind of getting released to the world um kind of just looking towards summer yeah and some bits and pieces out dropping them when it makes sense um but yeah very soon very soon great look out for it and um where can people find you if they're interested um at setmo music everywhere yeah we're everywhere yeah we do a, <laughs> yeah if you're waiting for original music to come we do a monthly mix series on youtube yep. setmo sessions yep. that we've um started recently a few months mm-hmm. back and uh we've been in consistent and diligent with so it's still happening which is great it's good that's half the battle um, yeah and you know that's a, that's a mix of live recordings from our shows that are that we really froth on or us recording sets in here or well no Extra. it's real fun. there is a bunch of unreleased stuff that we've been playing in those sets so that's actually a great spot to go and yeah suss them out have a little looky yeah cool and uh the last question is what do you think the meaning of life is Ooh. be happy yeah whatever that means for you find space and freedom to live a life true to yourself and figure out like if you're not doing that right now figure out what that looks like and then figure out how to get there cool Ah, all right i'll I'll let's you leave on that one (laughs) yeah i mean sometimes you don't need to say anything else it's okay yeah yeah i think it's just yeah very much recently uh, uh, i've been leaning into that idea of just like making every day like as good as it can be not 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 being like oh it's gonna be good next year when this happens or when that thing happens it's just like you know how's your average tuesday because that's how every day should be and it should be great you know Mm -hmm. so just trying to do all the things you love as frequently as possible true we don't know how long yeah yeah that's right i mean your life isn't really those big moments it's those everyday things for sure Mm -hmm. for sure yeah, I, I resonate with that a lot. Stu, Nick, Setmo, you guys crushed this. Thank you for coming on your first long form podcast. Thanks, Thank you for giving us space. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, yeah, you it's guys crushed this. Enjoyed it. it was a yeah, really nice conversation. Um, I appreciate you guys. Appreciate your energy. It's really nice to catch up. Um, yeah, killed it. Thank you, bro. Hopefully, Thank we'll you. see you in New York real soon. Hell yeah. yeah let's get it done. Let's get it done. Yes. Uh, Pool parties, and, uh, let's go. Yeah. yeah All the parties. Yeah. You guys went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. I love it. And uh, look, anyone else listening to this and got to the end, please give this a like, subscribe, and the podcast are rating. It helps us a ton. Until next time.